Have you ever felt artistic before? Being a biology teacher, the only art I do are biological diagrams. For instance, this scribble would represent the plasma membrane of an animal cell and the scribble in the center, its nucleus. You can view my chapter two video on cellular components to know more about the cellular components as well as the organelles within. In today's video, I'll be describing the structure of the plasma membrane as proposed by these two learned scientists called Singer and Nicholson in the year 1972. So we'll talk about why they chose the name fluid mosaic model to represent a plasma membrane. Besides that, we'll also learn to explain roles of each component found in the plasma membrane. So come join me in BioWorld to explore the plasma membrane. If we were ever able to magnify the structure of the plasma membrane, of course not by using a magnifying glass, but using a very powerful electron microscope, we would be able to visualize the fluid mosaic model as proposed by Singer and Nicholson. Based on the fluid mosaic model, the plasma membrane is mainly made up of the phospholipid bilayer. However, there are a number of different molecules placed within the bilayer. Mostly, you will find protein molecules embedded in the bilayer. On the outer surface of the plasma membrane, the surface that is facing the extracellular fluids, this surface will contain short carbohydrate strands called oligosaccharides. Oligosaccharides are polymers of monosaccharides, which are not more than 10 to 15 monosaccharides long. Please remember, these carbohydrate molecules will not be found on the inner layer of the plasma membrane. Carbohydrates will not be facing the cytoplasm. Now, another molecule that you will find at the fatty acid tail will be the cholesterol molecules. So this is the structure of the fluid mosaic model. Let's explore then as to why Singer and Nicholson chose the name fluid as well as the name mosaic. The plasma membrane is fluid, meaning that it is not a static surface. It is a surface that is in constant movement. This is best described by observing the behavior of the phospholipid molecules. In an aqueous solution, the phospholipid molecules tend to form a bilayer. This is due to the phospholipid characteristics, which you can learn more about from my chapter one video on lipids. Now, when the phospholipids rearrange to form a phospholipid bilayer, the hydrophilic heads are in contact with the aqueous solution, while the hydrophobic tails will be hidden in between to be away from the aqueous solution. However, this arrangement is not a permanent or fixed position since there are no strong bonds attached between the molecules. Instead, they are arranged in this manner due to weak hydrophobic attractions. Since these attractions are weak, the molecules can easily separate and drift apart. They can drift apart using two methods. The most frequent method is called the lateral movement, where the molecules move from left to right. Another more rare movement is known as the flip-flop movement where the molecules from the upper surface exchange position with the molecules from the lower surface. So you can see that these molecules are dynamic, constantly moving. This movement is not limited to the phospholipids. Even the proteins can be fluid.
now that we know that the membrane is fluid, let's move on to factors that can affect membrane fluidity. Firstly, temperature. At normal temperature, the intrinsic kinetic energy within the phospholipid molecules make the molecules constantly move. However, they do not move too far apart. In this way, the membrane's fluidity is maintained. But when the temperature is increased, the kinetic energy within the molecules also increase, causing the molecules to move apart more frequently. When this occurs, the membrane fluidity increases. The next factor is the combination of unsaturated fatty acids within the phospholipid molecules. For example, these phospholipid molecules have tails that appear almost linear, indicating that these phospholipids are made up of saturated fatty acids. So, they can actually be closely packed to maintain membrane fluidity. However, if the phospholipid is made up of unsaturated fatty acids, then there will be kinks where double bonds form. These kinks prevent the close packing of the phospholipid molecules, so in that way, the membrane fluidity increases. Another factor that can increase membrane fluidity is the presence of cholesterol. Cholesterol will keep the phospholipid molecules apart, causing the fluidity to increase. Let's now discuss the term mosaic. In English, mosaic is a pattern made up of small irregular pieces of stone. Let's apply this concept to the plasma membrane. You see, within the bilayer, there are randomly arranged protein molecules. So, Singer and Nicholson would have used the term mosaic because they could visualize a pattern made up of irregular pieces of proteins embedded within the bilayer. There are what we call integral proteins, which are either completely embedded within the bilayer or partially embedded within the bilayer. These molecules are firmly bound to the membrane. There is also another group of proteins called the peripheral proteins that are only touching the surface of the bilayer and they are loosely bound. Just as how phospholipids are amphipathic, proteins are also amphipathic, meaning that they have ends that are hydrophilic as well as ends that are hydrophobic. So in this diagram, the hydrophilic ends of the protein are the ones which are in contact with either the extracellular fluid or the cytoplasm, while the parts of the protein that are within the bilayer tails are the hydrophobic regions of the protein. We are now familiar with the structure of the fluid mosaic model as well as to the reasons why they were called fluid and mosaic. But now the question is, what are the phospholipid bilayer, the carbohydrate, the cholesterol or even the proteins for? Well, let's find out. We'll start with the role of the phospholipids. As you know, phospholipids are amphipathic, so the first role is to arrange in a bilayer when placed in an aqueous solution. Due to this bilayer, we have the second role of the phospholipid, that is, to form a boundary around the cell protoplasm. So in this way, the composition of the internal environment, that is the cytoplasm, can be maintained to be different from the composition of the external environment. 
The third role of the phospholipid is that the phospholipid can help to maintain the fluidity of the membrane. As discussed earlier, fluidity can be influenced by the weak hydrophobic attraction between the phospholipid molecules, change in temperature, as well as the composition of fatty acids in the phospholipid bilayer, whereby presence of unsaturated fatty acids in the phospholipid tails can cause the membrane to become more fluid. Now, the fourth role of phospholipid is in transport, where it enables semi-permeability in the membrane. Semi-permeability means that there are certain molecules that can diffuse into the cell by moving through the plasma membrane. This is possible mainly for non-polar molecules that have no charge as well as small molecules that can slip through the gaps between the phospholipid. Molecules that are charged such as polar molecules like glucose or ionic molecules like sodium or chloride, they are unable to cross through the plasma membrane. So the semi-permeability is caused by this phospholipid bilayer. Now we'll discuss the role of proteins. Some proteins can function as hormone receptors. So target cells with hormone receptors will have integral proteins with an active site complementary to the structure of the hormone. When the hormone attaches to the receptor, it will trigger a biochemical process to occur within the target cell. Proteins can also function as enzymes. Peripheral proteins facing the cytoplasm may have active sites that are complementary to the structure of the substrate. So now, when the substrate attaches to the active site, a biochemical process occurs causing products to form. Proteins are also important in both active transport as well as facilitated diffusion. This method of transport is necessary for charged molecules, either polar or ionic. These molecules cannot enter the cell through the phospholipid bilayer because, as mentioned earlier, the phospholipid bilayer is semi-permeable. So, the proteins make the membrane selectively permeable where it can choose which molecule should enter the cell or otherwise. To do that, the integral proteins will open up a passage that will enable these molecules to slip through the plasma membrane. Proteins are also very important for building of tissues. Tissues develop when cells join together. This is known as cell adhesion. So if there is another cell above here, both cells will stick together through the use of proteins. Now we'll look at the role of the oligosaccharides. There are two types. One is positioned on the hydrophilic heads of the phospholipid called glycolipids. The other is on the hydrophilic end of the protein called glycoproteins. Keep in mind that the oligosaccharides are positioned on the surface facing the extracellular fluid. So this makes it suitable to function as receptors. Besides that, the oligosaccharides can also function as cell identity markers. The role of carbohydrates as cell identity markers are extremely important to white blood cells of the immune system. This is because the pattern of the carbohydrate will help the white blood cell determine whether the cell is harmful or harmless. To make the explanation simple, what happens is 
the white blood cell will compare between the carbohydrates of both cells to the carbohydrate on itself. Now, if the carbohydrates match, then the white blood cell will decide that this cell is part of its own body and thus will not attack this cell. But when it finds that the carbohydrate is different from its own carbohydrate, then it will confirm that this cell is foreign and needs to be digested. Not only carbohydrates work as cell identity markers, proteins can also function as cell identity markers. Finally, let's discuss the role of cholesterol in controlling membrane fluidity. As discussed previously, temperatures can affect membrane fluidity. High temperatures increase fluidity, while low temperatures decrease fluidity. Now, cholesterol will help to return fluidity back to normal. For example, over here, there is large space between the phospholipids, causing the membrane to become fluid. So what cholesterol will do is insert itself in between the phospholipids, thus closing up the space. In this way, the membrane's fluidity can return to normal. Here, where the membrane's fluidity has decreased, the membrane is now considered rigid. What the cholesterol will do is it will squeeze itself in between the two phospholipids, pushing them further apart. So in this way, it can increase the fluidity to return to normal. With that, we have learned about the structure of the plasma membrane based on the fluid mosaic model as proposed by Singer and Nicholson. We've also learned why it is called fluid and why it is called mosaic. And in conclusion, we learned about the roles of each component of the membrane. So I'll see you in my next video. Bye-bye.